Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Bright Blue's panel event today, looking at the, where the UK energy market is on its journey to net zero. My name is Alexandra Joseph, and I'm on the board of Bright Blue, which is an independent think tank and a pressure group for liberal conservatism. Uh, it has seven major research themes, which include bountiful economy, clean environment, good lives, rewarding work, empowering government, just institutions, and connected communities. In hosting today's event, we are very pleased to be partnering with KPMG. Uh, if you're on Twitter, please do uh, use hashtag bright blue, hashtag CPC23 for the event. And the Twitter handles are at wearebrightblue and at KPMG UK. The post-pandemic energy crisis exacerbated by the war in Ukraine has put energy security and affordability at the top of the political agenda. But whilst prices are gradually starting to fall, the supply of secure, clean, affordable energy depends on the long-term transformation of our energy system. The comparatively relevant recent creation of the uh, Department of Energy Security and Net Zero and its Powering Up Britain blueprint uh, brings these two agendas together and sets out a pathway to greater energy independence through the deployment of low carbon technologies. I understand Claire Cortino, the Energy Secretary, has just confirmed uh, businesses will be able to use more of their rooftops for solar panels as well as a, um, putting forward a, an 80 million fund for in insulation on social homes. Um, and if we skip to the slightly bigger agendas with the approval just last week of the uh, largest no no North uh, Sea oil field in years, the energy trilemma of balancing uh, security, sustainability and affordability is far from being solved. So this afternoon's debate will examine where are we on that road to net zero, what more can be done to improve our energy security and how do we do it without undermining the government's 2050 net zero emissions target. So we've asked our panelists to cover a number of questions. I won't read them all out, but they know what they are. I'll highlight three, uh, which are, are um, as consumer bills begin to fall this year, what should be the key priorities for energy policy, including for the energy security bill for the rest of the decade? Uh, what will and should be the UK's main energy sources over the coming decades? Uh, how can the costs and benefits of these net zero transition be distributed fairly across consumers, businesses and taxpayers? And what are the economic opportunities for levelling up that are associated with the green energy transition? So a few questions there to get us started. Um, <laughs> we are delighted to have six panellists to debate these important questions with us. We have Andrew Bowie MP, who is Minister for Nuclear and Networks uh, and is also MP for Aberdeenshire and Kincardine. Um, Emma Pinchbeck is Chief Executive of Energy UK. We also have Sam Richards, Director of Britain Remade. Uh, Nick Mulhall, who is Head of Climate Policy at Aviva Investors. Uh, Patrick English, who is the Associate Director at YouGov. And Simon Verley, who is Vice Chair and Head of Energy and Natural Resources at KPMG. Uh, so we've just got an hour to cover a lot of ground on a hot topic. So I'll invite Andrew to kick off our discussion today. Yeah, thanks, Alexandra. And uh, thanks, Bright Blue, for, uh, for hosting this event. Uh, I don't I don't know if, it, uh, if anybody else has noticed, it actually feels like an energy conference more than a party political conference uh, this year, walking into the exhibition hall and seeing just so many uh, uh, companies, energy companies, uh, with stands uh, and pushing uh, what they are doing uh, in terms of driving us towards a more uh, secure and clean future when it comes to our energy. It is the dominant uh, issue uh, right now, within government and actually uh, out with government. And I think it's fair to say that... Uh, when going out in the doorsteps, talking to constituents in my uh, part of the world, or indeed uh, travelling the world, as I have been doing recently for the department, every country, every, everybody in this country uh, is, is talking about it, is talking about energy bills, uh, and everybody in the world, and every country in the world, is struggling with the dilemmas that we face ourselves in terms of uh, reducing our carbon emissions and becoming more energy secure and independent. Uh, it's because it is such a pressing issue that the Prime Minister took the decision in February this year uh, to create the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero. And I was absolutely delighted uh, to have been asked to uh, serve in that department as the Minister for Nuclear and Networks. Uh, because uh, notwithstanding the fact that the entire department is busy, focused on you know, dealing with the issues that we're here to discuss this afternoon. In terms of the, 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 the number one issue that we need to resolve, it is it is the network. Uh, every single uh, 
day of every single week, every single month, I have companies, organizations, local authorities coming to me complaining about the connection times for this, that, and the next project or business or whatever it might be. And it is becoming a huge economic uh, issue. Uh, we need to resolve the connection times. We need to improve uh, grid capacity. We need to build the infrastructure necessary to, to move this country forward and to attract the inward investment if we are going to continue to deliver and head down the roads that we are uh, very much on right now, reducing emissions, uh, driving down bills, and indeed becoming more energy secure and independent. And, and, and it is... Yeah, it's a challenge, uh, to put it mildly. There are there are many issues that we face uh, in regards to dealing with uh, the issues. But we have, you know, we've, we've taken great strides forward, as Claire said. We are the only uh, major uh, economy to have cut emissions by the, by the amount that we have whilst growing uh, our economy. We've cut emissions faster than any other G7 nation. We're doing so much in terms of investing in uh, new nuclear, investing in research and development when it comes to fusion. We've got the first, second, third, and fourth largest offshore wind farms uh, in the world. We're now, uh, as a result of the recent auction we've got further investment in tidal uh, power uh, we're looking at long-term storage uh, uh, opportunities technologies uh, as we speak right now so we are taking huge strides uh, down the path of investing in the technologies that are going to get us uh, to net zero by 2050 and, and we are committed to that target by the way and, and, and in my view that the reason that the department is energy security and net zero is the two that are, are completely and inextricably uh, linked the more we can reduce our reliance on highly volatile uh, gas prices and fossil fuels for our energy base load the more energy secure and independent we will uh, become and that is why it's it's vital that we deliver on all of our projects from these new renewables, new technologies, and indeed uh, on our investment in nuclear as well. That is not to say that oil and gas will not be play an important role in an energy mix moving forward, which is why I was delighted that the Prime Minister announced 100 new licences in the North Sea in the summer and indeed the announcement of Rosebank uh, uh, last year, because we need to be ensure that we are not going to be reliant on uh, hostile foreign actors uh, for our energy baseload, and oil and gas will, as I said, play at least some role in our overall energy mix uh, moving forward. I haven't answered any of the questions that were set, <laughs> set to me uh, by uh, Alexandra at the beginning, but I'm sure I will come to them when questions are asked uh, from the floor. Just, I think sometimes within the Conservative Party, and actually I think in the country, people think it's, it's energy security or uh, net zero. And I think it's really important to recognise, as I said, that the two are inextricably uh, linked. And to deliver, uh, uh, to, to make this country more energy secure and more energy independent, we need to advance as fast as we can down that route to net zero in a pragmatic and proportionate way, as the Prime Minister said last week, but we do need to deliver, and that is what this party is absolutely committed to. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ari, uh, Andrew, for um, framing the debate. Uh, I think the number one issue that you, you mentioned there was the network and the grid capacity, um, but also clearly there's a need for diversity of solutions there as well. Um, Emma, can I uh, invite you to give the industry perspective? Yeah, do all of energy policy in five minutes, <laughs> I think is the brief. No uh, I should say before I start this that Energy UK represents the incumbent sector, so we've got everything from uh, gas fire generation to renewables generation to grid to retailers, which means I have the fun job of trying to see the system from end to end and in many ways solve the similar number of problems on Andrew's desk, none of which are easy in the short term, but all of which are pretty clear in the long term. And if I characterise where we're at right now... We're in the middle of a massive economic transition, and so I think pragmatic and proportionate is interesting language in the context of the scale and the speed of change that we're seeing in the sector. Um, I went to a roundtable recently with the chief exec of JP Morgan. This is becoming my, my if, if you've heard this anecdote before, if you are an energy nerd, I'm sorry, I'm going to tell it again. But the chief executive of JP Morgan said in a roundtable with lots of different members from across the economy that the US's Inflation Reduction Act, which is largely their net zero strategy in disguise, has delivered the biggest shift in capital markets he's seen in 30 years, bigger than the 2008 financial crash, bigger than the pandemic. I know, surprising. But it tells you about the scale of the investment into this space. That's not really surprising, because what it feels like if you're in the energy sector is an economic transformation of the kind that we haven't had for 100 or so years. It feels like it must have felt like to look at a steam engine and think, that looks interesting. I wonder what that looks like as an economic model. When we look at cheap renewables, electrification, clean hydrogen and some of these other technologies coming forward. And all around the world now, as the minister said, we've got countries trying to compete in that space. Just in the UK, just my members, back of the envelope, we can see £100 billion worth of investment in our known pipelines. So it's big. 
And I think the other thing that's changed in the three years I've been doing this job is that it, the green agenda, as it's characterised, has moved from being about net zero to being about energy security. And that's because, very simply, our exposure to the gas price crisis was the amount of gas that we import. Gas is sold and bought on global markets, and so, like it or not, the the immediate fix to that for both bill payers and for system security is to try to reduce your exposure to imported gas demand with uh, alternative technologies. And so all of a sudden, the things that we've talked about as being green have become something that we're seeing as a security play, and that's really interesting. I think the third frame that we're thinking about is infrastructure across the piece as being central to economic productivity. And I would pitch to you that the energy transition is in fact just a a massive change with our core infrastructure that underpins the wider economy and most of the businesses I talk to are interested in clean cheap energy because it will drive their own businesses so lower inflation more efficient business practices and a modern economy there are a couple of things two two frames in which I look at my job one is building a lot of stuff and so the kit that we need and the other is the people on the receiving end of the stuff and if I think about investors and building the big change over the last couple of years has been Ukraine, but actually particularly the Inflation Reduction Act. And now our two biggest um, competitor markets for the UK energy industry are US, which is an economy with the Inflation Reduction Act, and China, which is a planned economy. And I think that's really worth thinking about if you're a policymaker about the scale of intervention that we're seeing in markets and where investors are choosing to put their money and the kind of security they can get. Um, we know that we'll be the bottom of, of the G8 for renewables investment by 2030. That's our own analysis. So that tells you that we were winning the race, but everyone is now competing to catch up. And there is a £60 billion gap between what we can see in our forward pipelines and in the auction systems and what we need to deliver on 2035. The good news is 75% of that money is going to come from the private sector. This is a private sector driven transition really for policymakers it's not doing the job for us it's just making it easy to invest so that's the big challenge there the other half of the equation is of course people and how they experience this transition and again in the last couple of years obviously the most significant factor is bills and prices and we're in a period of higher prices although the wholesale markets have settled it's still you know bills are double what they were three years ago and look to be set that way for some time so if you're a policymaker, i think thinking about the structure of your retail market thinking about price is really important and whether it's something to do with stability, predictability and, and what you can offer customers in terms of support for the most vulnerable where we think policy brain should be. Again, the good news, just like upstream, displacing some of the technologies that make us more dependent on gas does have an overall impact on bills. So the Prime Minister's announcement of increasing the heat pumps grant, very smart if you're also trying to get more people to electrify their heat and thus reduce your gas imports. And, and this is a personal view, but I'm very excited about the transition and demand side. We don't talk about it, but a lot of the jobs we can see in, in the future in the industry are about installers installing energy efficiency and heat pumps and new technologies. They're about our world leading uh, companies innovating in data and smart systems and new tariffs and, and exciting uh, bits of energy that are very rarely talked about, but where a lot of the UK's economic value is and our ability to still lead the world is. So I think we should spend more time talking about buildings and heat. Um, and then I suppose that leads us to what we want, probably over five minutes, but the, in the short term, then if you look at that, if it's investment in people, what we need this winter is really reforms to the fiscal environment. So just like every other business, we'd like capital allowances that deliver for us. We'd like decent expensing. We'd like to be able to get on with investment. We've just had two auction rounds that haven't delivered stable offshore wind, uh, certainly enough to meet the government's own 2035 target. Andrew knows this because I've chewed his ear off about it. But about this a few times. I've talked about this a few times. So we need auction systems that deliver and we're expecting to see budget, volume, price actually reflect market conditions where we've got a supply chain crunch internationally. And we'd like the government to have plans in place for winter support. For us in the sector, the crisis is not over, and we've, we've got rising debt for people on bills. And because of the end of the government support, we think more people will struggle this winter than last winter. So something there would be good. And lastly, especially for Andrew, the Connections Action Plan, please. Yes. So the next bit of grid reform. You know, looking forward, which is hard to do when you've been in a crisis, the industry is utterly committed to net zero, or whatever you'd like to call it. You can call it energy transition if you like. I don't care, but we're doing it. Um, what we'd like is for government to enable us to do it faster. And a lot of that is about 
making it easier to build projects. So grid planning, skilled workforce, the fiscal environment. Beyond that, it was also about what does the world look like when it's cheap renewables on one end of the system doing different things to what gas has traditionally done. And then on the other end of the system, we've got heat pumps and EVs and people using energy differently. What is the market design for that? What are the services? What does retail do? What is the world we can build? And the next government will really have to get to grips with that, um, which means good institutions, things like an energy system operator that's independent, you know, clear roles for the civil oh, service. So this is all coming, it's promise. <laughs> <laughs> this side of the election, or and then, <laughs> and then I think lastly, I'd be remiss if I didn't say this. Given business is very pragmatic, to use that word. We will wait because there's a general election. Everyone knows what happens in a general election with messaging. I don't know about any of you. Everything goes a little bit mad. And I think we bake that in. Having said that, I think there is a line. And given that what the government seems to be outlining now is a market-led, investment-led, incentives-led approach to delivering net zero, the really important thing is industry also having confidence. And so the message does really matter for institutional investors. They read the headlines. And I think some boosterism would be welcome alongside the incentives increasing. And that's not unfair to say to you, Andrew, because you know I've said that before too. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks very much, Emma. Probably a, a handful of things, not least uh, for Andrew to come back on a later point. But in the meantime, Sam. Thanks very much. Uh, so for those who don't know, Britain Remade is a pro-growth campaign. And over the last 12 months, we've been right across the country from Aberdeen to Anglesey, from Blythe to Birmingham. And what has been the number one issue that every business has come up with, that everyone has come up with in the pub, has been the cost of energy. It won't be, won't be wholly surprising. Um, as has already been said on the panel, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, it didn't cause uh, our energy insecurity. It revealed mm. just how reliant we were on imported fossil fuels. Um, so if Putin, if we've got to this position whereby we are uh, dependent, reliant on countries that wish us harm, that wish our citizens harm, how have we got here? Well, we at Britain Remade think that the core problem is that we fundamentally haven't built enough stuff recently. We're the country that split the atom. We built the world's first commercial nuclear power station, and yet it's been 27 years since we've built a nuclear power plant in Britain. It takes 13 years to get a new offshore wind farm up and running, despite the fact that building the thing takes two. The government has recently slightly relaxed the rules on building onshore wind in England, but it has been effectively banned since 2015. So why is it so hard to build stuff in this country uh, we think a large amount of the problem is the, the grid connections that we've that we've already touched on, and I'm sure we're going to talk about more. Um, but also, it fundamentally comes back to our planning system. The real tragedy, the real tragedy of our current planning system, is that at the same time that we have been failing to build the green sources of power that could cut all of our bills and make us less reliant on despots, at the same time that we've been failing to build the cheap energy to boost British industry, we've also been failing to protect nature. Every key biodiversity indicator from insect life to farmland birds is in decline. And this has happened under the current system, under the current framework of planning rules that both make it far too hard to build clean sources of energy and also at the same time fail to protect British nature. So we at Britain Remade think it has got to be possible, it has got to be possible to devise a new planning regime that both speeds up the deployment of clean energy and also, in doing so, diverts some funds from clean energy developers to mitigation uh, for habitat restoration. And, you know, you can look at what's happening across the channel in the EU, uh, in Spain in particular, they have a, a spatial planning regime, and it was interesting to hear the Prime Minister talk about potential spatial planning mm -hmm. in his speech last week, but they have a system whereby uh, early on in the planning system there is uh, uh, 
a strategic uh, overview of those areas that are of high biodiverse value, medium and low, and in those low areas, developers can crack on and build the sources of power that we need. And we think um, that might be uh, something to look at. Um, on nuclear, again, I know, you know the, the creation of Great British Nuclear is, is excellent, and we've, we've needed this vehicle for a long time, but we're going to need the sites because at the moment the government is still sitting on the siting strategy for where we're actually going to build <laughs> this next generation. It's all coming. It's all coming. It's, 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 all, it's all coming. Um, the, there is uh, a, a deep frustration at just how long, amongst everyone that we speak to out in the country, about just how long mm. it takes to get this stuff done. But at the same time, there is great opportunity here. Mm -hmm. There are millions, billions of pounds lying on the floor that we can just pick up if we get the planning regime right to enable us to build these new sources of power fast. And that will both put us on track for net zero and also make us significantly more energy secure and significantly more prosperous as a country. Excellent. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, a clear call there for building stuff. Uh, the siting strategy you mentioned, grid connections is coming up repeatedly here. The planning system um, is clearly another area for, uh, for discussion as well. So um, if I can invite... Maybe another hour. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> another hour that wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't uh, still be enough. Uh, Nick. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. So uh, I'm Nick. I'm the head of climate policy at Aviva Investors. So I'll just share a couple of things about Aviva very briefly that are relevant to this debate. The first uh, one is we are a business that thinks long term. We've been around for 325 years and we plan to be around for several centuries more, providing services to over 18 million uh, customers. And that's why we have a 2040 net zero emissions target. Uh, we think that tackling climate change is absolutely essential to protect the interest of our consumers. And we're confident that we can also give our consumers good returns by doing so. So the whole net zero agenda really matters to us. The second one is uh, we are big supporters of the levelling up agenda. Uh, Aviva is actually historically a collection of lots of small insurance companies that were deeply rooted across uh, the UK. 90% of our 15,000 strong workforce in the UK is based outside London in places like Bristol, Norwich, Perth, York, Sheffield and other, uh, and other places. So distributing the economic benefits of net zero across the UK is something that we pay great attention to and it also informs our investment strategy. So I want to focus on, on three things here. Uh, the, uh, we were sent lots of really uh, great questions. So I think three things are quite pertinent for us as investors to talk about are what we see as the key deployment barriers for low carbon energy. Uh, what we then see in terms of what's happening globally, we're a global investor, we invest in North America, Asian market, Europe, not just the UK. So any lessons that we can learn from what other regions or nations are doing. And finally, I want to touch a little bit on the economic benefits of levelling up, and I'll try and do all of that in the remaining four minutes. <laughs> so. Um, Starting with the main barriers to the deployment of low carbon energy, uh, Emma, Andrew and Sam have done a great job of covering the market reforms we need to do to make the CFDs viable again, the issues with grid, uh, absolutely need to look at that. Uh, I would just add to that on the technical side, the importance of having a, a whole system strategy for how we are going to get to a fully decarbonized and secure power system uh, by 2035. So what I mean by that is that outside of the, the, the wind farms and the grid, there's a wide range of other investments that we would like to better understand that will be vital to make to keep the grid secure, such as the on-site response, interconnection, the whole of hydrogen and batteries in providing a degree of storage to the grid. Uh, we need to understand what the policy framework for all these things will be, because they will have an important role to play to help us get there. But the other big issue that I want to focus on here is around the importance of consistent uh, policy messaging. Now, putting aside the detail of the uh, Prime Minister's speech a couple of weeks ago, we found the overall narrative of the speech fairly unhelpful. We felt that it was a speech that was very much focused on the uh, presenting net zero as a cost. From our perspective, yes, there is an upfront cost, absolutely, and we need to work hard to try and reduce it, but it's an investment, i.e., you put in money in electric charging infrastructure in a new power system and so on, but you will make a return on investment and we need to put together a public policy framework that will allow us to maximise that return on, in, on investment, allow us to grow supply chains in the UK, create jobs where they are most needed, and also importantly, cut the cost of those solutions for consumers and make the transition as practical for them as possible. Um, 
And this stuff really matters. Uh, a few years ago, the Crown Estate did a report on offshore wind, and they found that for every 1% that you reduce the cost of finance for an offshore wind project, mm. and the cost of finance is really influenced by an investor's perception of political risk, you could cut the lifetime cost of an offshore wind project by 6% with a massive impact, on pe positive impact on people's bills. But that goes obviously both ways. So consistent policy messaging uh, is really, really key. And I think that's something we, we need to, to improve in the current climate. Now, what can we learn from other countries? Um, I mean, the UK really has had a head start in the net zero transition. I think it's important that we recognize that. And we did, we have seen, you know, a huge amount of progress on the power side, especially in the, in the 2010s. But we're far from our own now. And uh, if you look at the IEA report that came out last week on their net zero roadmap, they estimate that we're going to go from below a trillion pounds spent last year in clean energy to $1.8 trillion having been spent in clean energy assets in 2023 alone. And that is driven by competitors who have very ambitious policy plans, public funding strategies and industrial strategies in place. Uh, it's not just the US with the Inflation Reduction Act. It's not just the EU with the Green Deal industrial plan, albeit that's really worth paying attention to, but it's also Japan with its Green Transformation Program, it's Korea, India, who caused a few problems at COP26 with the language around coal. They have a target of installing 500 megawatt of renewables by, um, gigawatt, sorry, by 2030. That would be the equivalent of meeting two thirds of India's electricity demand from renewables with a massive downward impact on the use of coal. So all that is happening. There is a genuine global uh, competition for capital and we really need to, to wake up to that. Um, now there's a range of things we can learn from the countries. They've obviously got ambitious public policies in place. They've got market mechanisms that we've had with the CFDs. But two things for me stand out. One of them is the targeted use of public funding. All of those nations that I've listed or regions are focusing public funding where there are market barriers, either because technologies are still emerging, like in heavy industry, or because projects are particularly complex, such as mass, mass retrofit of homes. So I think we can learn from that. The second thing is they, they tend to, um, they've turned their um, policy solutions on net zero into industrial strategies. Uh, if you look, for example, at the Green Deal industrial plan, the number one focus of what the EU is trying to do there is to avoid over-relying on any one country for any particular supply chain or any particular critical material, as well as maximizing supply chain growth, job creation, skills investment uh, domestically. But I think we could. We, there's a lot for us to, to learn from that. Very final point on leveling up. We see the net zero transition as a massive opportunity for, for leveling up. Uh, you look at energy efficiency and low carbon heat, for example. The uh, Construction and Industry Training Board a couple of years ago did the report showing that around a quarter of a million jobs could be created throughout the country if you were to retrofit every single home in the country to EPC by C. Uh, heavy industry, when the net zero transition is an opportunity to create low carbon chemicals, cement, steel clusters across all our industrial clusters from Port Talbot to Teesside, Humberside, Grangemouth, Southampton area. So there's lots of opportunities there. But the key thing is we need a skills policy to make sure that we can really tap into that opportunity. So beyond all the clear policy signals, we need to send all the clear market mechanisms uh, that we need to put in place. We need to have the right skills policy for those currently going through the education system or those currently in work and facing a major change in, which, in the way in which their industries are going to operate to receive the right, the right support. It's a key part of ensuring a just transition but it's also a key part of attracting investment. If you don't have a well-qualified supply chain, a well-qualified uh, skill set, the supply chain investment will go elsewhere. So it's really important that we press ahead with the Net Zero Skills Action Plan, which I think the government is currently working on. Mm -hmm. I'll stop there, thank you. Thanks very much, Nick, um, and for outlining the, the barriers and the benefits and uh, giving us a flavor of the international perspective there as well. Um, Sam, oh, uh, sorry, Patrick, um, Perhaps you can give us uh, the, the view of what people think on the round. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, so, um, net zero. One of the questions that was uh, put to us uh, as panellists uh, was thinking about the challenges and opportunities around net zero and decarbonisation and the energy transition. And I think one of the most significant challenges or opportunities, depending on how you look at it, is public opinion. And that is both in terms of individual behavior and changing how individuals interact with the net zero transition, but also in terms of carrying the public with you as a policymaker, as someone in industry, someone who's involved in investment decisions toward the net zero future. So I want to sort of start out uh, in, with the Yugov hat firmly on. I'm going to look down because I've got, I've got numbers down here and I want to get them right. 
But um, by 71% to 16%, the public think that we should have net zero by 2050. There's overwhelming support for this. And in fact, that 16% includes a significant amount of people who oppose that policy on the grounds that they want it done sooner. <laughs> so that's where we are with public opinion. And it speaks to a much wider, what we would call a climate consensus in Britain right now. Brits overwhelmingly think that climate change is happening, that humans are the cause of it, either to a major or a large extent, and that industry, government, and policymakers should be doing things to address it. They also, by a margin of 62% to 24%, think that even if other countries aren't pulling their weight, Britain should be doing what they can, what we can, to be moving toward net zero and decarbonisation. And to speak to what Andrew and Emma uh, sort of mentioned earlier, one of the most interesting things I've noticed in sort of uh, green polling lately has been this, 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 this fusion in the public mind that's happening between climate change and net zero and security, mm. and particularly mm. energy security. And that's been crystallising quite clearly in voters' minds as we've been going through this polling. However, when climate change and net zero and all these issues meet or come up against personal cost, the polling gets a little bit less overwhelming mm. in this sense. And that's, I think, where one of the major challenges lies. So, ULEZ, for example, has a very bad rep right now. And if we go, as we did recently, poll the uh, British public and say, would you like a ULEZ style arrangement in your area? We tend to now find more people opposed than support that. And that wasn't the case as little as a year ago. So things have changed in that. So if you're someone who's interested or local authority interested in maybe putting a ULEZ style thing in, you're going to need to do a bit of rebranding because things like low emissions and what have you, nah, it's not really polling that well. Heat pumps, taxes on meat, taxes on frequent flyers, these things are also not polling too well, particularly if you frame it in terms of a personal cost to the British public or to individuals. However, the British public remain really steadfast about things like energy infrastructure and energy efficiency. One of the most unpopular things that Rishi Sunak did, uh, well, what Rishi announced in the sort of recent sort of rollbacks on net zero, was canning the, uh, the landlords, uh, the responsibility for them to have energy efficiency, more energy efficiency. That polled very badly indeed. People wanted that to come forward, whereas pushing back the diesel car bans, that was generally supported a little bit because people didn't think it was a realistic deadline anyway. But at the same time as all of this, by 60% to 22%, the public do accept that individual members of society will have to contribute toward the cost of net zero. So they do understand that there will be some cost. And what does that tell us? Well, aside from public opinion being very complex and having a lot of contradictions, which we all know, <laughs> it does tell us that there is a sweet spot. There's a zone in which the public will be willing to accept personal cost. And I think some of the policies and some of the discussions aren't quite in that zone yet, but it certainly does exist. So there are opportunities to carry the public with you. And I might just sort of close off with a few remarks about where the public are in terms of things that they will support as a public cost, and maybe to sort of iterate uh, that point a little bit more. They're looking for leadership, really, I think, and they're looking for responsibility and for businesses to step up and government to step up. However, we notice that they will support things like creating green spaces at home and volunteering time to make more green spaces in their community. We also notice that they will be willing to make their homes more energy efficient if there are government subsidies. Not buying single-use plastics and regulations around restricting the use of those in, in commercial spaces. Switching to renewable energy providers, very supportive of that, very willing to do that. Protecting and restoring natural environments, so thinking about things like rewilding, very popular. People are very willing to see that happen. And yes, eating less dairy and meat, but maybe not the tax on it just at the moment. And if I might close by uh, speaking a little bit about the other side for a moment. GB Energy is one of the Labour Party's most popular policies in the polling right now, particularly with swing voters. And that connects very closely, I think, to uh, uh, energy security and the role that security is going to play and the role that bills are going to play in the election coming forward. So people do want to see net zero, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And they are willing to pay for it and they do accept that they will have to. There's a little bit of a disconnect now in some of the policies and some of the language. And I think that's where the opportunity drive needs to go. Great, thanks very much, um, Patrick. Uh, clearly where there's a personal cost involved, a public opinion can change. Um, but you've mentioned there a need for leadership. Um, and maybe there's a few other questions there we can unpack on the, the Mies agenda as well. So, um, Simon, over to you. Oh, the challenge of going last on a panel <laughs> like this, eh? Uh, so pretty much everybody's picked my best line, so I'll just reinforce 
uh, a few things and pick up on a few things that haven't been mentioned. Uh, we're a global business, so we advise clients all around the world. Uh, we can feel that gravitational pull of mm -hmm. the Inflation Reduction Act, so the amount of activity we're seeing on deal flow in the US, we can feel the gravitational pull of the EU Green Deal as well, mm -hmm. the activity in the Middle East, in China. Uh, so, and I think it's not, I just want to make this point, it's not really good enough for the UK to say, well, we're not offering you the tax credits, we're not offering you the subsidies, but we'll just have the same regulatory equivalents. You need to have even greater clarity on the regulatory framework if you're going to counter the tax credits that are available. To be honest, at the moment, it's a pretty easy thing to do as an advisor to say there's more money on the table in the US or the EU or elsewhere at the moment for some of these green yes. investments. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry to say it. Uh, I very much agree with Andrew and everybody else in, in terms of planning grid connections, won't repeat that, and on. We've got to fix the parameters for AR6 pretty quickly. Uh, you know, my clients absolutely want to invest in offshore wind, but the parameters, we need to get them right for the next auction. Um, we've got to maximise all those cheap sources of low carbon power, so welcome what the Secretary of State said this morning about um, uh, solar, and also welcome, you know, what we heard this morning about energy efficiency. You know, energy efficiency is the way to get bills down permanently, mm. and so we mustn't, uh, you know, take our, our foot off the floor on that. And I think the FSO really could be the start of a reform of the governance of our energy system going forward. Yeah. And I think we need that kind of Bank of England for Energy style model, yeah. uh, which is given a mandate by the government of the day, but has a very clear remit to advise the government on the way to get to net zero uh, at least cost. A um, couple of things that haven't been mentioned that I think is just worth saying. Hydrogen and CCS, we simply can't afford. I can see a few people in this audience that have been on the journey <laughs> with me. We simply can't afford for a third failure on carbon capture yep. in this country. We absolutely have to make it work this time. So we're really looking, my clients, looking for pace on that now and pace on the hydrogen agenda. Uh, and we have been world leaders in disclosure rules. So all the corporate reporting rules the UK has absolutely set the pace. They're really, really important for our corporate clients in terms of the transparency that they now bring. So let's just make sure we've got the policy frameworks in place to enable those corporates to invest and meet the commitments that they're now having to disclose on. Uh, but I did just want to finish with the, the point that Nick mentioned about skills and supply chains. We can't make net zero all about cost. Yes. It's not all about cost. Net zero, there are great opportunities here. There's jobs, uh, there are economic benefits here, but we have to get behind that skills and supply chain agenda in a serious way if we're to maximize those benefits. So uh, I think those are the points I wanted to make. Thanks. Great. Uh, Simon, thank you very much for your final reflections there. And I, I was wondering when hydrogen and CCUS would come up as well. So um, I'm conscious that we only have uh, 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes or so left for the discussion. And I don't want all of that to be taken up <laughs> by the, <laughs> um, the, the minister. But I do feel that um, <laughs> I do feel that we need to come back to you to uh, answer some of the questions and, and points that have been made. So can I invite you? To, to speak, yeah, and then we'll look, go to the audience. First, I really do uh, push back hard on the on, on the on the idea that somehow we're failing, or that we haven't been investing. I mean, or, or or that because the rest of the world has suddenly got their act together and America's taking the net zero agenda seriously by throwing gargantuan funds at uh, new projects and technologies, that somehow that we have we have we are, we are not uh, leading the world. We are. We have led the world. We were the first country in Europe to legislate for net zero. I like, I'm not going to go through the stats again uh, of all the things that we have done uh, over the past ten years to get us into the world leading position we're in right uh, now. But we have what we have done has been transformative. There there is there is for example today no coal being used in energy generation uh, in the United Kingdom when that was first uh, brought up as a, as a suggestion as a policy I think it was Ed Miliband himself said it was going to be it was a pipe dream that it could ever be achieved uh, we have got a huge uh, uh, well I'm going to go I've, I've written down some of the things to, to sort of uh, come back on so a lot of what we've spoken about today is being uh, dealt with for example the regulatory framework the creation of the future systems operator if some say we're going to have to stop calling it the future systems operator because it's here now uh, is being dealt with through the energy bill which I hope very very much, very much 
uh, given I am the Bill Minister, uh, that by the end of October will be the Energy Act. Um, it has got one very small hurdle to pass in terms of dealing with a community energy clause that's been reinserted by the House of Lords, and then it will go to the King uh, for oil assent, which is great news, because in terms of the regulatory framework, in terms of the framing for creating Great British Nuclear, in terms of investment in future fusion, in terms of building the stable foundations on which we can build everything that we're talking about uh, right here today, the Energy Bill is that is the, the vehicle that will uh, deliver that. Uh, the... the, the um, KPMG, uh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten your, forgotten your name, uh, Simon, uh, talked about the jobs and the economic benefits that can be brought uh, by this net zero, this energy revolution that we are quite literally living through uh, right now. And you're absolutely right. The very first visit I uh, undertook as a minister, as actually as exports minister uh, in the Department for International Trade, as it, as it was then, was to Gateshead in the northeast. It was uh, to the Green Trade Investment Expo. And it was... For me, uh, eye-opening, you know, gobsmacking to see the the investment, the technologies, the inventiveness, the ingenuity that is being brought to the table by companies, by organisations, by individuals based in the United Kingdom, making a transformative difference to the world, the world of energy. Uh, 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 right now. Uh, it, it is quite incredible. So yes, these companies are creating jobs, they're creating investment opportunities here in the United Kingdom, and we are going uh, to benefit from that, and we need to continue to support those companies doing that. Uh, the, 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 uh, we've talked about uh, everything that's coming down the tracks. The, the, the talk about Great British Nuclear. Uh, today we announced the first stage of our uh, down selection competition. Uh, six companies being taken forward to the next stage. By the way, we launched Great British Nuclear in July. We launched the SMR down selection process on the same day. We are now sitting in October and we've already gone through the first phase of that down selection competition. I'd like to, for government, that's you know pretty quick uh, to have delivered anything. So we're very proud of that and we'll have a final decision on technology or technologies that we'll be investing in uh, early next year. The siting strategy, it is coming, but we, we are, it, we are, it's being worked on right now as is the Connection Actions Plan being worked on by the ESO and by Ofgem and on Ofgem by the way, thanks to the uh, energy bill, Ofgem now has a net zero duty, which will allow them to allow uh, companies to make those anticipatory investments because there is a, a supply chain battle waging around the world and we need to ensure that companies in the UK are able to get out and buy the kit that they need to, uh, uh, to, to build the stuff that they need that are, is going to deliver our energy uh, for uh, the future uh, generations. The Windsor Review hasn't even been mentioned uh, yet. Our response to the Windsor Review is imminent uh, and uh, very positive. The review itself was incredibly positive. And there is a real focus on this. I cannot stress how much the Prime Minister and the Chancellor themselves are so zeroed, zeroed in to, uh, to this as an issue of importance. I mean, it's rather daunting for me as a junior minister to know that uh, almost every week the Prime Minister is asking questions about grid connectivity and the connections plan and, you know, investment opportunities that are not coming into the UK or might be put off because of the, 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 the delays in connections. But that, I hope, shows the this, this, this seriousness that at all levels of government, all of these challenges are being uh, uh, tackled with, uh, looked at. Uh, 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 right now and when we do form uh, the, the next government after the next election we're going to carry on uh, with the plans that we have set, set out just now I'm, I said when I was trade when I was exports minister in the department for trade that I had the best job in the world and I got to fly around the world selling UK PLC it was a pretty good gig um, uh, I, have, I, I do now genuinely believe that I'm the luckiest member of government because uh, member of this government because I am sitting at the center of this revolution in energy and the fact that we are here, the fact that this room is packed, the fact that there was a queue halfway across the hall, the fact that half of the exhibition stands at conference this year are from energy companies or organisations, the fact that this is number one in the Prime Minister's agenda of where he wants to take the country moving forward, the fact that, you know, because the rest of the world is catching us up, that somehow we should be embarrassed of where we are. This is a great place to be. It's very, very exciting. Yes, it's huge challenges. I don't deny that. Absolutely huge challenges. But thankfully, with the ingenuity and the inventiveness and the skills and the, the ideas that are emanating from just this panel, I'm pretty sure we're going to make it.
And in terms of, yeah, it shouldn't be looked at as a cost, it should be looked at as an investment opportunity. Absolutely, 100%. But we cannot deny that for a lot of people in the country today, especially on the back of a very hard winter last year when energy bills were very high, they look at the cost of an electric vehicle, they look at what it's going to cost to uh, um, um, change their, their, their gas or oil uh, for a boiler, and they do see it as a cost. So we need to do what we can to reduce the costs, to make it easier for people to make that transition, which they want to do, because if we don't do that, then we won't take people with us, and it won't be 71% that we're in favour, it will decline. So let's let, 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 let's carry on doing what we're doing. Yes, of course, go faster, go do more. I get it, we are, tro- we are. Uh, and watch this space, because in the next few weeks and months, there will be some incredibly uh, important announcements being made on all of the issues that have been brought up here already today. I hope that covered a, a well, few things. Well, that was a lot of ground <laughs> Okay, right. There, yeah, so thank thanks, you very yeah. much. Very passionate response there. Um, we'll go straight to the audience for questions, and I'll take them in, in pairs, I think, to start with, depending on how many we've got. There's a gentleman at the front here. I think there's a roving mic on the way. Yep, just coming now. Uh, gentleman at the front here, and then gentleman at the back. Thanks. Um, I just want to pick up on that point. It's great to hear people talking about supply chain and the need for a whole systems approach, um, and absolutely, absolutely welcome that. I'm from the Nuclear Manufacturing Research Centre, uh, so this is exactly what we want to hear. Uh, it was also good news to hear about the SMR selection process, although it does seem that we're still quite at the start of that process, and it's going to be next summer before we hear about Spring. the contract. Spring for the technologies, <laughs> summer for the contracts, ah, yes, I think. Yes, yeah. um, so, in my view, it would be you asked about um, what can we do to support security, uh, uh, economic security, resilience, energy security the single most important thing we must do between now and next summer is to invest in the supply chain capability Mm -hmm. to address the pinch points and the bottlenecks that we know exist, Mm -hmm. to invest in the test and demonstration facilities, the R&D, the manufacturing innovation. So can you just say a bit about what you're going to be doing in that over the next 12 months? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And then the gentleman at the back in in the outset. Uh, Hi, David Hickling from RWE, uh, the UK's largest power generator. Um, uh, Mainly point for the minister, which I think um, a thank you, firstly, that y- there is a lot going on, and I think you've set that out really well in your remarks just then, and you're right that we shouldn't be embarrassed about where the UK is going and the progress we're making, but one thing we should be embarrassed about is the AR5 outcomes for offshore wind, unfortunately, and and we should be embarrassed by that because it was a completely uh, unforced error uh, from, from the government and failure of public policy, which is very damaging for the UK's reputation internationally, and counterproductive because that's what people focus on rather than all the good stuff that you rightly mentioned. Um, It was really less a question, more of a plea to just say there are some quite quick, easy fixes that can correct that, that need to happen in the next few weeks before the government decides the next set of auction parameters. And it was really just a plea to to hope that that the department gets that and is is working on those solutions. Thank you very much. Um, Emma, did you you want to respond? I thought that people might I'm assuming charitably that most of you are energy nerds, because otherwise, why are you going for this <laughs> panel? But, but just in case you're not, um, the issue with the offshore wind auctions and the avoidable act of self-harm, which is how I saw it reported, that, not my words, um, was is to do with the fact that supply chain costs are up globally. So the cost of an offshore wind project is 40% up. I had a lot of people being like, that's because renewables are expensive secretly, and you lied about it on my Twitter in the mad bits of it. And just to be clear, that's yeah. the case for most infrastructure, and it's for all the reasons we've talked about. There are global labour shortages, inflation is up on debt equity financing, there are global supply chain constraints, and also everyone wants these technologies now. And government was warned about that because I... I came back from maternity leave in January, which is like a hard marker in my head. And my f- my first meeting on the job was going to government and tell them there was going to be a problem with the auctions. And so I think we are looking for a response that matches the global reality. And I think that message has now unfortunately been heard, but I wish it hadn't been in quite that way. Of course, what we do know is the next two auctions need to procure roughly twice the capacity that has ever come through a previous auction in order to get us back on track. So it's not just about fixing the price. We've now got to get our pipeline back on track. and. There are presumably answers on that coming. I wanted to say something about supply chain and early mover advantage as well. And just to be mean, Alex in the front row is in my public affairs team. And it's always, oh God, Emma, don't do this one. There's a, there was a Times cartoon after the Prime Minister's speech. And it was of Rishi Sunak dressed as Eisenberg Kingdom Brunel standing on the Clifton Suspension Bridge, some of you are nodding, with the bridge half completed. And the caption was, that'll do. <laughs> and... 
And I mention that because <laughs> you are quite right. I'm in this job at this time because I'm extraordinarily proud to represent the UK industry. And I am bullish about what we can still do. Hydrogen, carbon capture, floating offshore wind, composites, cables, smart skills and services. We made a flipping heat pump that cost like less than £5,000 on its high temperature last week in this sector. This sector is extraordinary. We have a lot to offer the world. We were ahead because we invested early. And the thing that I've learned in 10 years in doing this job is the earlier a government takes the risk, mm -hmm. the earlier we invest, the more of the payback we get. So actually, if we want the jobs, the benefits, the industrial strategy, the other economic co-benefits, we have to go sooner. And it's not about you know, maintaining our leadership. It's about getting ahead on the next iteration of the transition. And otherwise, we'll be like Rishi on the Clifton Suspension Bridge with it half done. And I want to finish the job. And did, did you want to... <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Challenge accepted. Right. Um, okay. Uh, to answer the point on R&D uh, and Great British Nuclear and SMR down selection in general, um, you know, we, this, we have moved incredibly fast. You know, I got appointed the UK's first ever nuclear minister in February. At that stage, it wasn't even a done deal that we were even going to have an SMR down selection process or that this country was going to invest in SMR to the extent that we are. So the fact that we are, we have established this down selection through Great British Nuclear and we're working it through as fast as we are, I think can give real confidence to an industry, the nuclear sector in particular, who has seen bright dawns in the past that have come to naught. So we need to ensure that this is not another one of those mo moments for nuclear. I'm incredibly encouraged by... I mean, I don't think there's another part of the energy sector that is quite as positive and upbeat right now as the, as the nuclear industry. I was in at the IAEA's uh, international conference uh, last week, and the UK reception and the UK events were massively oversubscribed by companies from, uh, uh, from around the world who want to invest in nuclear, new nuclear technology here in the United Kingdom. And n not just in terms of building the uh, nuclear power plants as we are at Hinkley and will be at Sizal and probably somewhere else as well in the near future because we're going to need a third gigawatt scale reactor too but also in SMR, AMR you know it's the work that's going on between ourselves and the Japanese on high temperature gas reactor projects on R&D and that side of things there's, there's a lot of work going on there so I'm incredibly encouraged that yes okay so then it'll be next spring contracts signed next summer but there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes to ensure that that industry that sector is in the right place we as a country are in the right place to really uh, jump when we need to uh, uh, when 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 we cross those final hurdles uh, next uh, year. There is no net zero without nuclear. Um, and the only thing that makes me say, I you know I go across to these things and I speak to have bilaterals with a lot of my uh, colleagues from around the world. And of course I talk about our great British nuclear program and how proud I am to be the nuclear minister. And we're investing, reinvesting in nuclear in, the, in this country in a way we haven't done before. Then of course you meet the. I'm very proud about building you know four <laughs> new reactors. And of course you meet my French counterpart. I says ah we're building 14. So um, yeah that sort of puts it into perspective a little bit. But it it, it is it is an incredibly exciting uh, moment. Uh, the AR5, auction round 5, uh, all I will say is that Minister Stewart, Graham Stewart, who is the minister responsible for uh, CFD, he is you know, taking very seriously the situation and is engaging widely with the industry and, and, uh, and work is ongoing in that space uh, right now. So I wouldn't, it would be out of place for me to give any more comment on that at this point. Thank you, Andrews. Sam, did you, did you want yeah, to? Yeah, I just wanted to build questions? a little bit off um, <laughs> the back of what Emma said. It's very reassuring, um, Andrew, to hear about the raft of uh, strategies and policies and everything that's going to be coming over the next few weeks. It's going to be great. I'm looking forward to it. Um, <laughs> but, it is um, going to be great. The, no, it is. It is. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, it, it absolutely is. Um, but the uh, to, to to build on 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 what Emma was saying, I think that um, you know we've been speaking to firms around the country and. Most of them, I, I think you're absolutely right, like we are not going to be able to match the wall of subsidies coming forward from the Inflation Reduction Act. And most British businesses, you know, RWE, they're not looking for huge amounts of subsidy. Some would even say it was a, a, a slightly esoteric decision um, by the government to increase the subsidy for heat pumps to seven grand mm -hmm. the week after industry produced one for five. But... Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, but you know, most of the firms just one that, for five. That, that I'm sure, most of the firms that you don't want subsidy, they want it, it to be easier to do business, mm -hmm. and that means removing some of the red tape and some of the barriers that is currently blocking us from building. Uh, and also, they want that certainty that Nick talked about. Uh, and you know, when you've got automotive manufacturers who are going 
uh, helpful ever, investing to 2030. And then they're told, ah, actually, we're going to do, do 2035 instead, three years after that policy had been announced. Um, this does not make the UK uh, an attractive place for international investors. So we don't need huge walls of subsidy, but we do need that longer term certainty and also the freedom to get building. I just struggle. One minute we're being told that we, you know, uh, you know, we should be looking across and seeing what Europe is doing and support. In, in Germany, in, the the deadline is twenty uh, uh, thirty five for uh, the ban and the sale of new electric vehicles. There's nothing stopping companies investing in electric mm. vehicles or rolling out electric vehicle charging points, and we encouraging we're encouraging companies uh, to do that right now. What we're saying is we're not going to bring in a ban on 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 the sale of petrol or diesel until twenty thirty five, which is in line with just about every other major economy in the world, including, by the way, many of many of the countries where many of these vehicles are actually uh, being uh, produced right now. But we are still attracting huge investment. We are incredible. Look at the Tata uh, Jaguar Land Rover announcement just a few uh, months ago. We are determined to ensure that we have this you know, revolution in, in, in automotive, at, uh, in transport in this country. But it's got to be done pragmatically and proportionately. And the fact is that electric vehicles are right now just far too expensive for the average uh, citizen. So when the price, the price begins to come down, as it will, when the electric vehicle charging network gets to the place it needs to be, as it will be, then that, that will be the point at which uh, we bring in uh, the ban on the sale of new, 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 new uh, um, uh, petrol diesel cars. And that is in the view of government 2035, as in line with Germany, as in line with you know, Australia, many others. I mean, we, we know from projections by Bloomberg, Dominion Energy Finance, and from others that the sticker price for an electric car will match the equivalent ICE vehicle in the late 2020s. And clearly the 2030 play was to get ahead of the pack and signal that Britain is the place to invest. And this is why, actually, I mean, you're absolutely right. Nissan have said, well, look, we're just going to motor on and... Uh, and um, <laughs> come, on. come on! I didn't even mean to do that. Um, and, 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 and say that we, uh, we are, um, uh, are sticking to the to the twenty thirty um, deadline. Yeah, good, but actually, great. but actually, I do think that the the really significant part in the in the PM speech that has kind of maybe gone underlooked is this work on on, on grid connections. Yes. And if, yeah. if yeah. as you've said, yeah. Um, yeah, the PM and the Chancellor are focused on, on massively spinning up those grid connections. Because at the moment, we've got EV chargers sat unused at petrol stations because they can't plug into the grid. Mm -hmm. no, no. So, so if we do that, that could really, really drive the, the transition. Absolutely. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Right. Any more questions from the audience? There's a lady at the front here. Have we got the ro roving mic? Uh, good afternoon. Um, question for me is, so how pleased was the Cabinet Office and the PM when they saw the IEA report come out last week on the net zero pathway, which is actually suggesting that advanced nations like ourselves should be achieving net zero by 2045? So if now, next year, or at COP28, Germany suddenly brings forward their ICE ban forward to 2030 in Italy and others, what will the UK do? Okay, challenge there. Um, gentleman at the front here. Oh, sorry, can I ask wh uh, where you're from? Elena Skrutska from the REA. REA. Thanks. Uh, hi, thanks. Um, I'm Henry Chan from Friends of the Earth. Um, we uh, watched with some disappointment some of the recent uh, announcements. Um, I've got a heat pump and it's really good, and I, I was really interested in the kind of public opinion thing because one of the stories you don't hear about is how you get to live in a house that's warm all mm. day, which is a really big advantage if you are an old person who's retired, if you're working from home and stuff like that. So I'm interested in how government and others can help to actually promote some of the, the benefits, not just in the kind of cost side of things, but in the quality of life and mm. the health benefits and stuff like this of, of living in, in a house with actually a better heating system, not just a different... Um, low carbon one. But the real problem is you can't have one because there aren't any and you can't or there are far too few of them, mm -hmm. whatever they may cost, far too few people to stick them in your install them in your house with the skills yeah. needed to do so. And the small medium enterprises that would be training those people to do that job are really not prepared to take the risk of that huge investment from them when they see an inconsistent policy landscape from, from government. So what can be done to kind of get the vast numbers of workforce we need, this quarter of a million people uh, we've heard about, 
that we'll need to uh, retrofit something like 19 million homes. Um, you know, what is it government and others need to do to make that happen? Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, I will invite the panellists to respond to that and also perhaps wrap up their final thoughts because we're actually uh, coming <laughs> to the end of the conversation as well. So, um, uh, Emma, did you want to sort of respond to some of those I feel bad because others haven't had it. Uh, Does okay, anyone else yep. want to talk about perhaps, skills? Uh, Nick, that felt like... Um, I'll take the energy efficiency. That's a good job. No, but it's interesting because I've, I've been bruised by trying to get a heat pump in my house as well a few years ago for exactly that reason, mm -hmm. the lack of someone to do it. Uh, I, I, so I think clearly um, the announcement in the PM speech to increase the boiler upgrade scheme actually I think will, 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 will help there. Um, but I think what we're still lacking as a country, especially for the able to pay market, mm -hmm is a clear sort of regulatory, a set of regulatory targets that explains what kind of a level of energy efficiency and low carbon heat are we aiming to achieve for the able to pay home market and what kind of incentives will be put in place to sort of match those over time. Because I think that really sends to the supply chain that long-term signal that look, there is a growing market, not just for heat pumps, but also for insulation retrofit and different types of home energy efficiency improvement works that need to be carried out. It's therefore worth investing in workforce skills. It's therefore worth growing my SME to be able to, to, to meet that need. And we don't really have that at the moment. And that, I guess, was one of my disappointments last weekend when I heard about the Energy Efficiency Task Force. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a really good idea from the Chancellor last year to set up that task force. The whole point of the task force is to come up with recommendations, industry-led recommendations, on how to grow private investment in energy efficiency and heat, because a lot of this does need to be done by private in investment, and we, you know, we're very much up for that. Uh, so I, ho I hope that we're going to, I know that it was sort of, t well, I understand it was brought to an early end um, last week, but I hope we'll still get to hear from some of the outputs and recommendations from, from that task force, because I think we, we need a long-term set of mm -hmm. sort of regulatory targets and incentives. So we understand what the mar market for the next 10 to 15 years will be like, so we can really create a supply chain here. And address those problems and install these things at scale and, and properly. I'm on the Energy Efficiency Task Force, where I was. I did not actually know that, so this yeah. was not <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, no one should, because we're not publishing the continent. report. Um, so, so just to, I mean, on the on the retail in this, and I, I promise I'll do the, the kind of wrap up about the thing that hasn't been said, and it's this other end of the market we spent a lot of time talking about, like big stuff in the big system. I think it's worth saying that any of us that have worked on the energy transition for 10 years knew that this point in it was going to get a bit crunchy, and that's because the easy thing to do is to get large technology, well, easy-ish, is to get large technologies to scale and get the investment in, because it's big levers on a big system. And we're at the point now with power where we're integrating a lot of renewables, and they behave differently, and we're doing the markets, and we're doing the system, and grid connections are now a problem, because we're, you know, the, the volume of the, the change is the issue. Actually, on the politics, the reason it feels crunchier than it has done is it's the other end of the system that we're starting to look at. Just to meet the carbon budgets, we need to start doing heat and transport. That's now you know, the, a bigger problem for our emissions. But it's also where there's been a lot of innovation and a lot of thinking and a chopping and changing of policy over the last decade. So it all feels quite new, quite complex, quite challenging for ordinary people. And I have been sufficiently worried about this bit of the transition for long enough that I took the Energy UK job, partly because I thought someone has to be able to translate this energy transition for ordinary people. And believe it or not, my punt was that energy suppliers <laughs> might be able to do that. And your point about the heat pump, I think you ha we have to think about routes to market and who's going to sell these things and then who's going to do the skilled training. At the moment, a big chunk of the boiler replacement market is led by your energy supplier. They train the installers, they'll have a kind of nice branded um, van that will come out to your house and will do your boiler at the drop of the hat. That is exactly what the energy retailers are now moving into doing heat pumps. And Sam mentioned the five grand heat pump. Andrew, you're right. Currently, one supplier is selling a five grand heat pump. I would bet my life, because of how technology works, that other suppliers are going to start selling five grand heat pumps. In fact, that happened last winter when they all started selling three grand heat pumps with government grants. So. The, the retailers, because they're in between the system yeah. and ordinary people, I think uh, the key bit of the market to invest in this new infrastructure, heat pumps, EVs, EV charging, and the tariffs that support them to make them interesting and exciting and profitable for ordinary householders. So that's been my punt. They will also train staff. So Octopus is training centre in Milton Keynes has trained, I think, something like uh, like th thousands of engineers already. If you think about the size of the British gas, you know, boiler installer fleet, there's, there's thousands of staff. 
So we talk all the time about independent plumbers and they're hugely important, but the other half of that customer journey will be energy retailers. So there we go. So could we sort retail markets out? That'd be great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just to do that, I, that I bit. Is that coming? I don't know, <laughs> before the election. Um, so there's that on the on the politics, and this is, this is I suppose, we haven't talked much about people and how they feel about this. Mm. I looked at the polling and I think my sense of it was this, I think people don't know what net zero is. We had a poll in the field last week at Energy UK and actually 53% of the public didn't know what net zero was. I think it's a real bubble phenomenon to think that people understand what this is. And I think if you ask them versus everything else they're worrying about, it doesn't feature. However, energy and the energy transition does underpin literally everything else they're worried about. The price of their food, the cost of their energy bill, the availability of cheap infrastructure, factories, jobs, the wider economy, this is important to them. And I suppose what I'm highlighting is that when I look at the polls, I see a massive failure of communication, both on the part of government and perhaps ourselves as industry to explain why this matters to people. And I think when we've got a situation where cutting green policies in 2015 led to an £8 billion cost on everyone's bill in a gas crisis, when cutting green policies in 2015 meant 300 quid each on all of our bills, when the cuts to the private rental standards last week means that we've got renters who will find it harder to pay their bills when a quarter of people living in rental are in fuel poverty. I think we've got a real issue that explaining that yes, net zero has a cost, but actually the benefits more than outweigh the cost and what people are really worried about when they have heard about it is fairness. And I want to get onto a conversation about not whether we should pay, but who pays and when. Thank you. Um, Patrick, perhaps on that people and polling point, you could come, come in. Yes, no, not, not people polling. Not that's, people that's, polling. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a different one. Um, uh, yeah, so public opinion, uh, particularly around emerging issues and issues where there's not a consensus, is all about the stories you tell and the stories that resonate with voters and people sort of up and down the country. And there's a, 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 a sort of polling methodology, which we've been doing a lot at YouGov, and if anybody in this room is interested in working with us on it, I'd be very, very happy to hear from you, called message testing. Mm. And what we consistently find when we message test anything to do with energy and secur energy security and net zero is it is about the framing, and it's about the stories you tell, and it's about how you package these things up. To the point where, sort of post um, Oxbridge elections, a lot of the dials on you as were shifted by the way that the, the government and sort of commentators understood what was going on there and put you les up as a problem and a cost that was doing this bad thing to people right and that shifted some dials so the way that people frame these things does affect the way that they understand it and does affect public opinion and i do think so if sort of people in this room are interested in well how do we make these changes and how do we sort of carry more people with us it is about the communication and it's about the stories that you tell and connecting it to the issues as emma says that people really do care about i.e their bills and security cool. um simon did you want to come in on this yeah i i want to just remind we are as um minister said halfway to net zero but we do need to find this different language for the second half if i can put it that way mm -hmm. so you know the the the, the language around this is giving people more control. This is about lower bills. This is about more comfortable homes. This is about a greener environment. Mm -hmm. I think we can find a new language for this second half uh, of the journey to net zero. And there are ways to overcome the upfront costs. So let's use innovative private finance to find the ways to overcome those upfront costs of those new technologies we need to use. So I'm actually optimistic we can get there. Excellent. Um, Sam, any final reflection from yourself? Once we have abundant, clean energy made in this country, everything gets easier. Our household bills come down, the costs for businesses come down, and every single part of the transition will rely on that mass electrification. It will underpin the future of transport, the future of home heating, the future of industry in this country. So what do we need to do? We need to make it easy, as easy as possible to build the sources of clean power here in Britain. That means changing the planning rules to get stuff built this decade. We can be energy abundant by 2030, but we have to build the stuff. Excellent. <laughs> and, a, and a final word from, from the Minister. I, really know if I can add very much more, uh, actually, uh, after that. Look, um, I, I could speak... I've, I've already said uh, quite a lot uh, uh, this afternoon, and, and, and I hope I've outlined that we as a department, as a, as a party here in Manchester, as a, the party of government right now, uh, do recognise. And it was, we, we, it was us, the Conservatives, who legislated for a net zero. But I think we have uh, failed in one respect, in that we've never actually taken the time to explain 
to the British people what net zero actually is, uh, what it will mean for them. Uh, and the challenges that we're facing right now, I think, is, is as a result of that. And one of the first, one of the first questions I, I asked when I got uh, the job in, uh, in February was, well, we need, well, the challenges I set my team is we need to develop a narrative for net zero. What is it we're actually seeking to do? And, and, and why should people support us on that journey? Now, I don't for one minute think that somebody higher up actually heard me asking that question, but I'm pretty sure somebody was asking the same question in a much more important office than the one that I work in. And I think that we are now, belatedly, I agree, uh, beginning to form that narrative, to start explaining, to take people on that journey, to engage in that conversation with the British people so that we can uh, build what we need to build, when we need to build it, so that we can invest in new technologies that are going to power us towards net zero and, crucially, uh, make us more energy secure. I am gen- I, I, keep, I say I'm an optimist. I'm a Scottish conservative. I have to be an optimist. But, look, <laughs> um, I am an optimist. I do genuinely believe we can do it. Somebody mentioned COP. You know, when we go to COP, uh, I've never actually represented the UK COP, but I'm reliably informed by former Secretaries of State for Bays and uh, Desnes that when the, the UK is represented at COP, you know, we are, in, in, in many respects, uh, an example to the rest of the world. You know, they want, they want to know, what is, how have you managed? How have you managed to, to reduce your reliance on coal to naught? How have you managed to have the, the first to fourth largest offshore wind farms in the world generating power uh, right now? Yeah, the, 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 these are questions that the rest of the world wants to know how, how we've done it so that they can then do the same thing. And they are beginning to, and they are catching up. And that's a challenge because of the global race on skills and the global race uh, when it comes to supply chain. These are challenges, but it's a great place for us to be. Imagine if we weren't in this place. Imagine if it wasn't us leading the world and it was somebody else. We were sitting having this conversation today going, bloody hell, the French are miles ahead of us. We've got to do this, this, and this to catch up. No, the reason we're having this conversation today is because we want to stay ahead of the pack. And that that brings its own challenges, but it's ones that I know for sure that we can certainly uh, rise to. So, yeah, I'm confident that we're going to do it. Thank you very much. A positive note to end on. Um, We could have done with an extra hour, I think, but uh, it's been a very engaging discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, If you'd like to know more about Bright Blue, um, please ask the team or look online. You can sign up for membership uh, for £20, I'm told, uh, or £10 for students. Our next event um, is just in an hour in this room with the Housing Minister on the rental market. So join us for that if you're able to. Um, And with that, many thanks to our expert panel today for KPMG for being our our supporter and partner, and also to our guests for your contributions as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.